Hello again, this is David Boji and Grace Ann Rosil. We're the storytellers doing this storytelling series. Today, our poetic tribute to storyteller Gertrude Stein. It'll be a conversation between Gertrude Stein and Walter Benjamin. Did you ever meet Gertrude Stein? Are you asking me? Yes, I am going to be asking you if you ever met Gertrude Stein. No. Let's introduce our cast of characters today. So, playing Walter Benjamin. Okay, I am Gertrude Stein. Got my hair bun up here. And we'll be having conversations. So we've been going through the series on the four storytellers, Leslie Marmel, Silko, Silko, Gertrude Stein, Walter Benjamin, and we're going to get to Grace Ann Rose Hill at the end of the series. Today is a conversation between myself and Walter Benjamin. Some things about Walter Benjamin uh, I learned is Gertrude you know, in our various meetings over the years. Uh, in 1913, Walter attended the same seminar as Martin Heidegger, Heidegger rather, Martin Heidegger, at the University of Freiburg. This started a kind of a competition between the two of them. And 1917, uh, Walter married one... Dora Sophie Pollock, and they had a son named Stefan Raphael. In uh, 1919, you earned your PhD on the concept of art criticism, was your focus in German Romanticism. So you had an idea for a thesis on Duns Scotus, but it was too much like Martin Heidegger's, so the thesis was turned down. It is said that you fell in love with Hannah Arndt. Various points, so did Martin Heidegger. So you also met a very beautiful Ajla Liesis on the beach in Capri. And anyway, you got divorced in 1930. So just a little background that we didn't cover last time. You did not ask my permission to reveal these personal details of my life. Well, everybody in Paris knows these details. So, did I ever meet you, Walter Benjamin? I believe that's you, dancing with Alice B. Toklas, is that right? Yes. And uh, you wrote an autobiography in which you revealed at the end that the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas was you writing. I did not write about Alice. Oh, you're Walter Benjamin. I'm sorry. I wrote about Alice at the end of my novel about the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. I revealed, I got to get in character, I revealed that I was the author in a lesbian relationship. So I'm in this lesbian relationship and we're dancing. She's an American from California and I'm an American from Pittsburgh, the Allegheny area. And we fell in love and we stayed in love my whole life. At night, I did auto writing. I did uh, How to Write. I did The Making of America. It took me a long time to do that one. And four lectures on narration, 1936. So all night I write. I got my bun up here. I write. And all day Alice would transcribe and do the chores of the house. 
This is me. I had this bust formed, and I try to look very Romanesque and uh, very Napoleonic. And I come from this neighborhood in Pittsburgh, Allegheny West. I liked Allegheny West because of the French could not pronounce it, and I loved to watch them struggle trying to pronounce Allegheny. I grew up in Oakland and moved to Paris with my brother. We opened a, a salon, we bought some artwork, and I, I invited people like Matisse and Pablo Picasso, Cezanne, and a number of literary people who would become great. Some were great when I met them, others would become great. I entertained James Joyce, I entertained Ernest Hemingway, I entertained F. Scott Fitzgerald, Sherwood Anderson, T.S. Eliot, and Ezra Pound. Our place, our salon, was the place to go. Alice's job was to keep the women out of the salon so I could talk with the men about the matters of art, modernist art, late modernist art, the writings and the poetry. That was our place. There were times in my timeline where I might have met you, Walter Benjamin. I think I did meet you. I kind of recall early on in Paris, after my novel of Alice B. Toklas was published, the autobiography, there were other times we could have met indicated by the arrows. I drew out the arrows. I did a, lot of, a little bit of research over the time and I do recall you being at the salon, and I do recall you at the very end visiting us at the countryside. You were wealthy. I was not. Well, wealth is all relative, you know. It's really about the, the art you can buy with your wealth and enjoying a good life. I live in Paris because of the wine, the good food. I couldn't see myself living in America. Not anymore. I think we might have met in the summer of 1933 at the Salon. What might we have talked about? What might we have talked about then? Alice there with me, I would say, Alice, leave the room, let Walter Benjamin sit down, bring him some tea, some coffee, some wine, whatever he wants, and we will talk like two men together. Well, Gertrude, I have been reading your lectures for America. Brilliant. Uh, yes, I know. I am a genius. Everybody says so, and so do I. Because, you know, when you are a genius, you, you know you are a genius. And I'm sharing these advanced copies of the, what I'm going to talk about, and I'd enjoy your feedback. I do have a question or two. Go ahead. In your first lecture, let me read a direct quote. It is a rather curious thing that it should take a hundred years to change anything that is to change something. It is the human habit to think in centuries, and centuries are more or less a hundred years, and that makes a grandfather, a grandmother, to a grandson or a granddaughter, if it happens right and often does happen about right. May I ask, what are you doing? Uh, I'm sure as a historian, Walter, you know what I'm doing. I'm writing 
about history. You know, the, th the thing is, you know, this, there's a cycle. And every hundred years, you know, from the time of a grandparent to the time of yourself to the time of grandchildren, that span is about a hundred years. And what goes on in that hundred years happens. And then the next hundred years with another, the grandchild becomes a grandfather and they have grandchildren and that becomes a cycle. You but, know, Alice is typing this up at night and it, this is what is in the, the notes here that you're looking at. It does not seem to make sense though. Is this what you call auto writing? Oh, auto writing. You know, it, it started with uh, Picasso's Les Demoiselles de Avignon. And I really liked the painting. He was completely unknown until I introduced him to Paris society. And in the salon, he could meet everyone. And yeah, I started to talk to him. How do you do this, these paintings? And it looks absurd. It looks like these women, they're their limbs all spoon about. It looked ugly to me at first, but he explained it to me. I guess he was fairly unknown then. He did offer to paint my portrait. I knew it would be an investment, so I commissioned it. I think he needed the support. You too. I also had him do a portrait. I did not know that. So I had him do the portrait. I'll show it to you. Oh. Picasso did a portrait of me, and it was amazing. You know, he took four months. I think maybe he needed the money. I, I paid him each week during the four months. And during that time, he said, you know, your face, your face, your face. Gertrude, I can't figure out the face. So he went to France, in France, to the summer, you know, the shore. That's what French people do in the summer. They don't work. They go to the shore. The south of France, it's very nice. And he came back and he was rested and he painted my face in like you see here. And uh, yeah, people say it doesn't look like me. And, and he would respond, well, well, it will look like you, Gertrude Stein. It will look like you in the future. He said, it's very easy for someone to make a, a beautiful picture of a beautiful woman. Any painter can do that. But what's much harder is paint the woman as she will become. And Picasso also doing the cubism, he and I talked for the four months and every day in his studio and he would tell me how it was done and I got the idea, hey, I can do this with words. I can do cubism with words. It's basically it. How is auto writing all night long related to cubism? Well, it's, you know, you, you've studied art, the mechanical reproduction of art, and you know that a mechanical reproduction, it's not art at all. And, and you know that art was very stuck in its ways before the Impressionist and the Modernist and the late Modernist sort of unleashed art. And I saw this coming, I saw this coming and cubism, hmm, it, it is amazing to kind of take apart something and lay it out in pieces and then rearrange it, rearrange it. And that's what I did all night in auto writing. I would write out word after word, sentence out of sentence. I hate commas. I don't do too much commas. Just let it go. And in the morning, Alice would type it all out, typing it all out. And she would edit a lot. And we would talk, and then she would get it the way I want. And that's how it's done. 
Well, the painting is amazing. Yes, I do like it. You know, I read your essay on the, the storyteller. It was published, about to be published. It's in French, it's translated. I saw the early version of it. I really liked this essay, The Storyteller. I think we get at the same things in this talk I'm going to do to University of Chicago on narrative. It, you didn't seem to like newspapers. I didn't like newspapers. You don't like these pulp novels. I don't like the pulp novels. Seems like we have things in common. Yes, this relates to the kind of storytelling that I write about. Very cool. I use historical examples and I trace the historical forms of storytelling which are disappearing. Hmm. I got at some of that on my Berlin radio show for children. The one about the women's roles in the marketplace. Oh. I heard about I heard about Radio Benjamin that you were very famous in Berlin. Have you, are you getting a radio show in Paris? I don't think I have a radio show in Paris. Now, in your book, I read, well, I read an essay I guess it will be a book. I read an essay you published, The Storyteller, and there's, there's this thing you're saying that storytelling is coming to an end. Storytelling is coming to an end. You keep repeating that phrase, storytelling is coming to an end. I guess the disappearance of the skill of storytelling, but aren't we having a new storytelling now in modernism, late modernism, the arts? It is very different with the technology, with the radio. We have lost many things from, for example, the story that occurs in the marketplace. The stories are different. You have heard the story about the two kings? Yeah, I remember. I, I'm not sure I understand why that's a big deal. I just write, you know, the ways of telling or very telling are the ways of telling the ways of telling. Do you recall the story of the two kings? I do, I do. Um, okay, so there's two kings, and one king has conquered the others. But uh, so what? Do you recall the moment when the conquering king seeks to humiliate Oh. The other king. Yeah, I think, as I remember, the the conquering king had the children and the wife, maybe wives, go march down, this be marched down the boulevard on their way to the execution. I forget if they were being hanged or guillotined, something. And... Um, the king remained, who is the captured king, remained very stoic and hardly blinked. Yes, and then what happens? Well, let's see. Uh, 
there's a point in which the vanquished king sees a servant walking, and then he gets on his knees, he breaks down in tears, and he's just like, oh, why is that? Well, there are many reasons. Montaigne said, since the conquered king was already full of grief, this was the final straw, so to speak, which caused the grief to overflow. Huh. Some might say the servant was not responsible for the actions of his king. Therefore, his death was unjust. Hmm. But offering no explanation for why the king cries when he does is what makes the story alive. Oh, okay. Well, it's just another example of the ways of telling or very telling. But, okay. This story has survived from ancient Egypt to this day hmm. because it does not prescribe the answer to why the king cries. It hmm. still, after thousands of years, is creating astonishment and thoughtfulness. And it has that power even today. Hmm. Well, I think you and I look at it differently. I like wine. I like paintings. I like the current modernist explosion of style. Well, as with Cubism, there are many perspectives on what is true and what is a story. Okay. But to go back to Matisse, what is your interest in Matisse? Well, before we do that, let me ask you, why do you say that this king, these two kings, their squabble, is an example of true storytelling. Because it represents multiple perspectives, it leaves one with an open situation where many outcomes were possible and many motives could have come into play without specifying one rigid, reified form. Hmm. Well, you ask about Matisse, see if I have an example. So they met again, imaginary meeting, possibly, 1935 to 1937 again at the at-home salon in Paris of Gertrude Stein, might, what, might, what might they have talked about? Oh, you are allowing me into your salon again? Yes, welcome back. I've just completed the USA tour. I was a celebrity. I was on the front page of every newspaper I visited, every university town, community groups, filled the auditoriums. I got standing ovations everywhere. Some people didn't understand what I was doing. The ways of telling are very telling are the ways of telling, but I think they got my point on how to write. You know, I did some things on how to write, and it was basically, you know, the, the pattern of words, the balance of words to the paragraph. I think they started to understand the grammar of the modernist Cubanism, Cubism, right? I think they did. 
But I got off the American airline plane, big crowd, growling dogs. <laughs> and it was fabulous, just fabulous. How's your life been? So what is your point with this? Well, my point is that Cubism is a form of writing, you know, that's as artistic as Picasso's Cubism or Tamara de la Paquita's soft Cubism. You know, these are forms and the form I've created is a genius form. And I'm recognized for that in the tour. And people wanted my autograph and it was very, very exciting. You ask about Matisse. Well, here's uh, Matisse and the painting, high modernism, modernism, whatever you classify it. You're, you're an art historian, a literary critic, um, somebody who looks seriously at art. Well, you can have no central theme. Oh, you could have just colors. Uh, here's the colors of the women, exaggerated to an extent, but the sun picks up the blues and the greens and bounces off the dress. He did the same thing with the glass, a bottle, and it, it allowed me to think you don't need a frame around a picture. I have them in the studio here, but you don't need that. Um, Framing is not all that important. The picture is beautiful. I had to sell a Matisse recently. Really? Yeah, I would bring these artists along, and I hated to part with it. Your salon was covered with valuable paintings. Absolutely. Let me show you. Last imaginary meeting... 1939-1940. If Benjamin met Stein at her countryside hideaway, she'd moved, she'd moved out of Paris. I moved out of Paris with Alice. We moved out of Paris. But our art collection, nobody was going to touch it. I made a deal with Philippe Pétain, head of state of the pro-Nazi collaborist Vichy regime in France, uh, that my art would be protected. And in exchange, I would type up his speeches. I would translate them. Oh, well, Alice would actually type them. I didn't type. But Alice would type. But I really liked his philosophy, you know, the Fatherland of France, bringing back the ancient values from a century ago. This philosophy, I thought, was really kind of postmodernist. And I, I believe American would like this philosophy. So I wrote in the Atlantic Monthly an article about it. Now you, Walter, I hear you were in three months in the detention. Yes, it was quite tragic. It, it, I am not happy with the Nazi philosophy and with Hitler. Right, I'm, I'm not happy either with that part, but Philippe Pétain, I think he's got something to say. And, you know, he and I struck a deal and um, I was thinking of going back to America again, but I decided to stay in France and go to a country villa. And, uh, you know, I, I commissioned a piece for him for the wall of the famous artist. Uh, let me show it to you, see what you think. 
Here it is in the upper right. Doesn't it look good in the gallery, the red hat, the medallion? It is all too depressing to me to recall that era of the Nazi progress. Well, you know, we are two Jewish people and we agree to disagree. Takeaways from today. I think modernist art, cubism, soft cubism, one can do it with the writing. And I wrote the book, How to Write, did the narrative lectures to the University of Chicago. Imagine 500 students sitting in the auditorium applauding. It was fabulous, fabulous, the tour of America. And maybe after the war, I'll come back. You are quite well known. There's I, our little puppies again. I respect your success. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. I judge my own success, you know. I'm an enthusiast of the Vichy regime in France. I don't doesn't necessarily mean I agree with the rest of it. Well, I'm David Bochy, and I want to ask you a question, both Walter Benjamin, you Gertrude Stein. So, why were so many prominent modernist writers? at the Gertrude Stein's salon, attracted to fascist regimes and fascist ideas. Not all of them, but some of them. Too many of them, I think. Perhaps being change leaders, they were susceptible to the promise of revolution. Well, For me, as Gertrude Stein, revolution is in the arts, it's not with the guns. And I'm sorry you had to go to that internment camp. Where are you headed now? You're here, here, here in the countryside, you're going to the border, Spain and France. I'm not sure it's a good idea. Stay here with me. I think you are closer to Hitler's philosophy than you realize. I will go to Spain. Okay. Well, to answer that interrupting young man, we could tell you, sir, but then your time on earth would be over. The Grim Reaper would arrive. So if you liked today's presentation, give it a thumbs up and you can subscribe as well. So, so many prominent modernist writers at Gertrude Stein's salon were attracted to fascist regime. James Joyce, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, and a host of others, as well as Gertrude Stein herself. Now, doesn't mean that they were into the Nazi regime. This means they were a bit authoritarian to an extreme. This storyteller friend to advent guard of modernist writers Gertrude Stein, also supporter of Philippe Pétain, head of the state of the pro-Nazi collaborationist Vichy regime in France during the Second World War. To me, a tragic tale. And in Germany, Martin Heidegger, rival to Walter Benjamin since they were students, a bit more of the timeline of Walter Benjamin because he dies in 1940. January, returning to Paris, 
wrote on the concept of history, was arrested sometime around there by the French government, incarcerated three months in a prison camp. And I don't know if you know about what goes on in a prison camp, but they sick the mastiff dogs on you. They beat you with sticks and bats and starve you, ridicule you. I went to the museum to see all this in Lyon, France, and uh, the tapes and the recreations of the cells. And I'm telling you, three months in a prison camp near Nevers, Burgundy, for Walter Benjamin was hell. Hannah Arndt hitchhiked and walked to Montebo, a meeting point of refugees for Jewish refugees, fled Germany invasion, waited, waited for Walter Benjamin, who was a no-show. 1940, Walter Benjamin flees for French-Spanish border across Spain, but 25 September, Franco government canceled all transit visas and police arrested Walter Benjamin. Jewish refugees group, and on the 26th of September, it is said, suicide, overdose by morphine tablets. Others say it was the murder squad of Stalin, but in any event, he was ironically a Jewish man buried in a Roman Catholic cemetery. So as we look at today, we're the tribal wisdom for business ethics, uh, Grace Ann Rosil, and we'll be getting to her in the last session. And there are links to her videos, and I recommend them. And Don Papillon has one on Digital Ways of Knowing. And... It looks like we're going to have to fade out here. Spiritual Ecology by Gregory Cajete. Jay Francis does something else on tribal wisdom and education. And Grace San Rosil has a wonderful introduction if you want to read it. As part of the invitation, you can come to an enthinkment.com meeting. Come to Zoom by getting a hold of me, David Bogey any Tuesday, 1 p.m. Mountain Time, New Mexican Time. And for more of what I've been writing, a little bit more is in theaters of capitalism. As Walter Benjamin, you were a fan of Bertolt Brecht, and you write about it in the book of essays called The Illuminations. Next week, we hope to have the book arrived from Leslie Marmel Silco. We'll do a second episode on her. So when that book arrives called Sacred Water, we will. In the meantime, subscribe. We appreciate you for being with us. Don't let the green, grim reaper come and get you for not subscribing. It's a joke about YouTube and Google. Hope you don't mind.